Hi, I'm Tony. I'm Patrick. Welcome back to another episode of Cave to the Cross Apologetics. We're working our way through Scott Christensen's book, right? What about evil? What about that evil? Yeah, and so he's trying to explain, he's given us a theodicy to help us to see how God in all of his majesty, all of his goodness can coexist with evil and at least explain to a certain extent what, why uh, he allows evil, right? That's the basic idea of this particular theodicy. And we, we're in chapter 12, the fortunate fall, fortunate fall, right? And God's greatest glory. And uh, he's, he's explained to us that uh, really God's purposes is about his own glory. He's trying to reveal what he's like to his creation, right? right? And we have uh, gotten now to the question, he says, the greatest revelation of God's glory is in redemption. And so if that's the case, then the question is, was the fall necessary? Right? Did, was, if, if that's the greatest way that God can reveal his glory, then did God have to? Uh, you know, uh, have the fall, right? Mm-hmm. Was the fall necessary? And so that's that's where we've gotten to. And Christensen uh, is going to try to tackle that, you know, kind of conundrum there, right? right? He says sin ru- ruined the uh, entire creation, converting its righteousness into guilt, its holiness into impurity, its glory into shame, its blessedness into misery, its harmony into disorder, and its light into darkness. The emergence, he tells us, of evil appears to be a frustration of God's plan, a uh, good plan for the creation. Right. So and if yet, God wants to do this, he better make sure that he really wants to yeah, do it. Right. This changes the whole everything, thing. Everything has yeah. changed, yeah. And so he says, yet on the other hand, it seems inevitable that if we are to live in a world in which Christ the Redeemer supremely magnifies God's glory, uh, then, you know, it almost seems like it's necessary, right? Ooh. So uh, does this mean, he tells us, that evil's existence is a necessary feature of creation, right? Right. And the answer is... Uh, probably not. Yeah, <laughs> probably not. But it seems it seems to if if you were to take this logically, it, you know, it, we we can see the person asking this. Well, does that mean then that he had to create, and then he had to have a plan uh, to send a sin in the world, and then he had to send the redeemer to in, if if God's uh, considered his the magnification of his glory as the the ultimate means for creation, then this seems to be uh, uh, logically that. All these things had to have yeah. happened in God's order for him to, hand to do his force. Yeah. yeah. He forces so, his own hand by yeah. who he is. So if we are saying that God was absolutely compelled by his intrinsically moral and rational nature, who he is, then the answer is no. Nothing compels the supremely good God to fashion a world that contained evil. Nothing. That would be absurd. And there's nothing that forces his hand. There's nothing greater than God. So uh, by, by even that logic, uh, it's impossible for that to be the case. Right. This means that the introduction of evil is a consequence of some other condition related to the freedom of God. As Paul Helm uh, clarifies this freedom as that which is self-determining, he says, uh, Paul Helm says, God does not have to do what he does by any necessity of nature, nor is he free in the sense that he has liberty of indifference to opt between alternatives like a libertarian free will. Rather, he is free because he acts in accordance with his supremely excellent nature without coercion or hindrance. Mm. So uh, is God libertarianly free to be able to lie? No, he is restrained by his own nature of who he is. And and so that informs us of what's necessary and what's uh, 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 conditional. Right, exactly. And so he tells us uh, that the conclusion then is simple. Evil becomes necessary in as much as it brings about God's greater redemptive and glorious ends, right? right? So it's not necessary per se, but but in as much as it brings about God's ends and his glorious ends, then, you know, that's, that's kind of how it is, right? Does God create evil? Well, yes, in the sense that he creates all things. This is, you know, the Jonathan Edwards quote. Well, yes, but unless you mean like he forces us to to sin, then no, he's not the the author of evil in in that sense. Right, right. So the contention of the greater glory theodicy, that is Christensen's theodicy, uh, includes this point. Given God's freely chosen plan to maximize his extrinsic glory to his uh, image-bearing creatures, which he is under no compulsion to do, 
then there can be no world that does not contain the fallen redemption as well as uh, the means of redemption, which, which must include the incarnation, also the atoning death and resurrection and exaltation mm-hmm. of the Son, right? No world, he tells us, is poised to maximize God's glory uh, without these various features. Almost seems like it's the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so furthermore, the position advocate uh, advocated here does not seek to explain why this world contains either the extent or the horrendous degree of evil that it does. So how, how come there's uh, 400 million uh, parts of evil or how come uh, this one evil is a thousand percent different than this evil or this particular thing happened to my aunt Mary or your cousin Joe or whatever. Right. 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 <laughs> per the claims of skeptical theism, or uh, I think he calls it rationalism. There is, uh, there is no obligation to explain why God has chosen the precise mix of good and evil that this world contains. We might want that. We might like that, but without some sort of specific divine revelation, Uh, I think that's uh, uh, hard for us to do. Right. It is not possible that anyone could give such reasons. In fact, it's impossible, right, without a revelation. So God has all wise, inscrutable reasons for making this world as he has, with all its particular strengths and wonders and blessings and grace, along with all of its particular weaknesses and heartaches, curses, and evils, right? Uh, he says that this is um, um, more uh, a more defensible position than the classic best of all possible worlds. That's what you were alluding <laughs> right. to uh, uh, earlier, right? Uh, for it Because it preserves God's freedom, right? In the best of all possible worlds, God would have to create this world. And, and then that would take away God's freedom. Yeah. That's his problem with this that particular his, position. His critique of, of Leibniz here. Right, exactly. So this kind of world preserves God's freedom while maintaining his exalted attributes as being uh, that in which no greater can be thought of. Right, that's the... Uh, Anselm, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> St. Anselm's uh, ontological ar- yeah. argument, right? The greatest possible being. Mm-hmm. Uh, the freedom of the maximally great God to pursue maximally maximal glory makes no other world better than this world, which contains the greatest possible goods. And so there is no greater good for ill-deserving sinners mired in the pit of their own miserable sin, saturated, right, and situated within a world of miserable sin than to be set on the rock of Christ's redemptive righteousness, yeah. right? So... You know, this there's his point is not that God is forced to make this world because it's the, you know, the the best of all possible worlds. God made this world and there is no world that is better than this world. Right. Right. And scripture also talks about, you know, the the, the misconstruing of total depravity is that we're unable to seek after God because of how depraved we are. But God, it says, is actively restraining the evil of men. So we could even be worse. We could carry out more evils if God so uh, removed his hand and allowed us to, to be the free creatures that we, we are. He, mm. he restrains our, our nature even more. All right, so then he moves on to uh, the, the hope of the greater glory theodicy. What, what hope does this, this uh, idea give us then if it doesn't talk about the, the, the explaining the number of, of, of evils or the degree of which they come at us. What, what is the hope then? Well, the gospel of a redeeming Christ is the first line of hope in the face of evil and in the primary reason for the evil's existence. The gospel of redemption is humanity's greatest good in the face of the greatest evil that can assail us. Without this providentially orchestrated hope, no answer to the problem of evil makes any sense. So that, you know, if if uh, if God uh, uh, creates the world, Adam and Eve fall, and uh, God goes, "Oh, uh, looks like you failed the test. Wipe it away." Mm. Well, what what glory does that bring other than God's a judge? Right. But to 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 enter into creation, to take on the form of man, to be able to live a perfect life in accordance with God's law, and then to take all sin uh, of His people upon Himself and remove it as far as the east is from the west, and not only that, but then to obtain and give over that his godly righteousness to us so that when uh, the Father sees us, it's like he's seen the Son, 
and then he adopts us into his his family and then uh, conforms our our evil hearts more and more uh, throughout our, our lives uh, in the sanctification process to be like his son and then ultimately glorified and, uh, f- you know, f- fully glorified at, in, at, at death. Um, I mean, that, that's a more amazing story than yeah, I, yeah. I took the eraser and I erased it. <laughs> oh. So the cross alone makes the suffering that disfigures human history uh, understandable within God's providence. Uh, here are four important ways in which the greater glory theodicy brings hope through the redemptive gospel that it is centered on. So, so out of out of uh, the cross, which is the ultimate, and it's the 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 the, the first of preeminence. There's uh, probably other ones that we can cover, but this is this is the big one. So let's right. deal with what it brings. And so right. he talked about four different parts. Four different parts. So first, he says, Christ bears our sins, Mm -hmm. right? He says the atoning death of Christ addresses evil as it is perpetrated by us uh, and um, also as it is perpetrated against us, right? So not only what we do, but also what happens to us, the the death of Christ addresses that with regard to evil, right? When we consider the problem of evil, he says, we usually consider from the perspective of evil that comes on me, right? That's yeah. against me and against me unjustly. For those that sin against me, I will forgive them. <laughs> There's a, 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 a first part to that. Yeah. Okay. He says, but we must first consider a problem, um, you know, as perpetuated by our own rebellion against a holy God. Right. Right. That is also sin. So it's not just, you know, poor pitiful me, <laughs> but it's what I've done against God. It's my rebellion against God. Yeah. He says the grief that we bear for evil should first point us to our own culpable, that is blamable actions, right? And so he says the first signs of real hope come only when we acknowledge our sin and uh, and turn to Christ, who offers pardon and restoration, right? So First, God uh, in Christ bears our sin. And so this is a, this is a you know, part of the hope that he wants us to have. Not only does he bear uh, sin perpetrated against us, but he also <laughs> bears the sin that we yeah. perpetrate. We want to be selfish. That That's do. the most important part yeah. right there. Yeah. yeah. I don't care about anything else that happens, but if I'm, I'm to be right, then I want him to at least bear mine. <laughs> All right, so the second one is that Christ bears our sorrows. Hmm. So the atoning death of Christ not only bears our personal sins, but bears the sorrows that a sinful world brings on us. Uh, Jesus has uh, no reason by virtue of his own character to live a life of pain and sorrow. Uh, He is unassailably content as a member of the perfect blessedness of the Godhead. So the pain and sorrow he experiences as a man was that which he voluntarily took on himself vicariously on behalf of those he delivered from sin and sorrow. Uh, you know, I, I don't lay, or uh, no one takes my life from me. I, I willingly and freely lay it down on behalf of the sheep, uh, on mm-hmm. behalf of many. Mm-hmm. He, <clears throat> he bore our pain that exists as a consequence, not only of our personal sin, but of the sin that an evil world crushes us with. And yeah, so and, it yeah. crushed him. Exactly. And so this hope is that he understands exactly what we're going through, yeah. that he's been through it, that he's suffered through it, that he, in, in fact, bore the sins of the whole world on himself. And so that gives us hope because now we know we have a God who can identify with us, who knows what we're, you know, what's happening, how we feel, what it's like, and that sort of thing. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, Hebrews talks all about this of, of the the purpose that God has to be greater than the angels and the uh, the greater priest, even even after the line of Melchizedek, and you know he he has to be the the uh, the, the perfect um, um, representations so that that the the old sacrifices uh, uh, that were offered in the temple. Uh, to go back to it would be to deny uh, God's God's working, and again, that progressive revelation there is is this was pointing to uh, ultimately the end, and so uh, Jesus Christ is at the very end, so that when we kneel at the cross, that's where it's all taken care of. Right. Uh, and then thirdly, he tells us the third way that the greater glory, glory theodicy brings hope is um, by allowing us to focus on future glory. So we don't have to be stuck, you know, in our focus <laughs> right. right here, right? The New Testament, he says, instructs believers to continually keep their focus oriented 
toward their future redemption at the return of Christ, right? So we're looking for, uh, and this is what gives us hope is what he's suggesting. We're looking for the way things are going to be when Christ returns, okay. right? The redemptive glory that sustains believers, he tells us, in the now also points them to its greater uh, magnification and its future consummation, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, Pilgrim Fragus, again, wh- where's the journey go? Towards the celestial kingdom. Uh, he's stuck in the mud. He He's uh, going off a different path. He's being led astray. Uh, he's captured by the people of Vanity Fair. Uh, he's <laughs> he's being uh, tortured by himself, but also he thinks the the, the giant. Uh, but what, what, what keeps him focused? What keeps him going through the, all the hardship? Why doesn't he just end it? Well, there, there's the, the greater glory that that, that journey brings. Uh, again, it's, 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 God doesn't just take us out of the world as, as soon as we uh, um, come to the cross. Uh, we stay and we exist and we are utilized in a relationship with him. We're, we're able to, uh, by a means of grace, be the, the emissaries of God, mm. just as he uh, directed us to. And so uh, as we go along our path and we're the helpers and we're the evangelists and we're uh, 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 faithfulness along with, with Christian along his way. Um, we're, we're going towards the celestial city that we can see in comparison, look how it was, look how it is, look, look how and it look, will be. Yeah, exactly. And so he quotes Paul in uh, second Corinthians four, who says that for this light momentarily, momentary affliction is preparing us. He, he tells us for an eternal weight of glory beyond beyond all comparison. Right. Right. Yeah. So the future glory would be muted, domesticated, uh, stripped of its ever refreshing wonder without being preceded by the persistent nagging, biting, agonizing pangs of affliction that mark our present sordid existence. Exactly. Right. And so thirdly, glory, right? (laughs) right? Thirdly, future glory. And then fourth, he says, with regard to the source of hope in his greater glory, the Odyssey, is raising the banner, he tells us, of divine grace. So the greater glory, the Odyssey, is centered on the wonder of God's grace as manifested in redemption from sin and from evil and Satan and death and hell, right? And where does God's deepest love for humanity resides? Well, it, it resides in the unparalleled manifestation of his unmerited grace to humble wretches like us, right? He says this is a feature of God's eternal, immutable character that finds no occasion to be displayed apart from the fall of his creatures, right? <clears throat> right. So four really good reasons to hope right there. So he uh, finishes up the chapter here by uh, quoting uh, John MacArthur, who's proclaimed the whole reason God ordained evil to exist was for his own glory's sake, so that forever and ever holy angels and redeemed saints would give him glory in full com- uh, comprehension of his, of all his attributes. And uh, I believe it's uh, Hebrews says that that the angels even look upon redemption and wonder yeah. and uh, and glorify mm. that, that, you know, a- angels aren't redeemed. Uh, uh, you know, he, 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 uh, God in the end will, will, uh, capture those that, uh, that rebelled and, uh, lock them away, but angels aren't redeemed. And so when they see redemption, they, they wonder and marvel at God's good glory and, and, and kind of see, uh, what, what they're unable to obtain because they have, they have kind of no comprehension of, of what it's like to, to manifest that other than the fact that what God is doing is, is even uh, uh, demonstrated to them. Mm. So prior to sin, uh, God was not uh, worshipped fully for his righteousness against the background of unrighteousness. He was not worshipped, uh, nor could uh, nor could be, fully for his love until he demonstrated the kind of love that loves enemy rebel sinners. He was not worshipped fully for his holiness until his wrath displayed how he hated sin, and he was not worshipped for his grace until he displayed forgiveness and mercy on the elect. In every case, there is a great discourse, a disclosure of God's nature. Why? To display his glory. Right. So notice what MacArthur is saying here. 
Prior to sin, God was not fully worshipped for all of these characteristics, right? His righteousness, right? Uh, his, um, his demonstration of love to his enemies and rebel sinners, right? His holiness was not seen um, and therefore wasn't displayed and worshipped. That is his hatred for sin and, he, and his grace, right, was not seen. Yeah. And, and so sin, the fall, the misery that we find ourselves in, the whole issue of evil uh, allowed all of these various characteristics and attributes of God to be manifested mm -hmm. and therefore worshipped and to portray even more fully who God is and his glory. Yeah, right? yeah and, uh, you know, uh, read the Puritans, read the uh, uh, church fathers, read the the, the those uh, in, in the middle of the Black Death, uh, read those in persecution, uh, read those who uh, were f uh, forming new nations. But what what is kind of the the central focus that they keep going back to, even in the midst of these hardships? It's his glory, his righteousness, his demonstration of his power. Uh, it's the the redemption uh, story. Uh, you know, we we even uh, take those motifs and we write our own stories based on that uh, of us. Uh, coming into the world and making our own garden and and uh, s setting up hedges and protections and expanding out and redeeming the land and and uh, um, uh, taking the wilderness and capturing it for ourselves, uh, you know the, the church history is replete with demonstrations and writings about these plus all his other attributes. So how how could we we uh, get those uh, types of writings which inspired men to to write and 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 you know, not in the uh, air-conditioned, uh, nice uh, uh, brick houses that we, we can have these days, but, you know, in, in squalor where uh, children are dying and you're, you're marrying four, four different women over the course of your life because of the death and, and childbirth mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, the, the Black Death takes away a third of humanity a, a, a away uh, because we don't like cats, you know. <laughs> how, how are all these things being written about if not for that very evil? And so... It seems to be making this case that uh, Romans nine talks about is, uh, you know, what purpose does it serve? You know, how, how can how can we um, um, allow you know kind of God to do this? Because this is uh, the way that He is able to manifest these characteristics. It's the 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 way that we come to know who Christ is, and we see just the utter despair and and wretchedness that He takes on by stepping down just being human but then living the perfect life and ultimately paying the, the perfect uh sacrifice and then also bestowing it, god's righteousness upon us right. like we just we we don't see that through any other world than the world that we exist in right. exactly. so that's the, the the amazing point of of uh of this uh theodicy mm. Mm. good all right so that's the end of uh of chapter 12 and again um uh the one thing that I like for, that Christians does is I think he's a teacher at heart. So he has his key terms, his study questions to, if, if you find, uh, find yourself going, oh, what was that a thing again? Well, or, or how to focus, uh, maybe your study of this, then, then he has those questions and then further reading and even advanced reading for us, <laughs> us super nerds that, uh, that want more. So anytime you put, uh, Edwards and Plantica together, uh, probably probably is going to require a lot of brain work and right. and cold water because because uh, your brain overheats. <laughs> so they're they're part of the advanced yeah. reading right that he lists here yeah edwards and plantica yeah, yeah. all right uh so that's that's uh his theodicy in in kind of a nutshell in three episodes uh, we were able to cover it but guess what there's more to the book there's more yeah so uh <laughs> next time we'll talk about chapter 13 god's redemptive glory in scripture and we'll see the the biblical proof for this theodicy Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. See you next time.